In the early 1800s, the American prairies swarmed with game. Vast herds of deer and elk grazed on the gently rolling land. Flashing across the western plains, the sharp-eyed pronghorn antelope ranged far and wide. The grasslands bristled with the ever-watchful prairie dogs. And other small game were too numerous to count. The moose, the largest member of the deer family, ranged across the northern portion of America, favoring a cooler climate and a different diet than the plains animals. More dangerous wildlife, like the black bear and the unpredictable grizzlies, roamed the mountain areas. Yes, America teemed with a variety of game in the early 1800s. The rangelands provided food and spacious surroundings for the herds to multiply. But all of these animals were greatly outnumbered by the millions upon millions of buffalo. We hunted for the hind quarters and the tongues mostly, till the price of their hides went up. Then when the railroads started coming through, why, the buffalo herds would choke up the tracks and them passengers would snatch up their rifles and shoot them just to see them go down. Then, in 1871, a new hide tanning process was developed and it doomed the American bison. The soft buffalo leather could be toughened up so that hides were good for shoes, boots, saddles, almost anything cow hide had been used for. The price of hides went up to a dollar, and soon the prairies were filled with a different breed of animal, the buffalo hunter. A good hunter could earn $50 a day killing and skinning buffalo. saw them buffalo dead on the ground, so thick you could walk 10 miles on their carcasses. And when there weren't no more buffalo, people went around picking up bones to sell to the railroads. They, they made fertilizer and fine china out of them bones. The Indians and the early white hunters took their chances hunting buffalo. Arrows, spears, and early rifles were short-range weapons, so they'd have to ride right into the herds or sneak up close. It was mighty dangerous business. They usually killed only what they needed and used all of what they killed. But the shooters of the 80s didn't have a lick of sport or spunk in them. They killed for money, and buffalo hides were as good as cash. The tools of their trade were the Sharps Big 50 or the 4570. These rifles fired a single shot and had a range of 650 yards. The Indians call them the rifle that shoots today and kills tomorrow. Each hunter hired his own skinners. The going rate was $40 a month or 25 cents a hide and all the buffalo a man could eat. The hunters and skinners worked on the plains for months at a time, following the herds and living off the land. It was a hard life. The hunters were tough, greedy, and they were mean. When you're out here with me, Pilgrim, you don't make a sound. Not one. Each one of them hides is worth $2. I ain't gonna let you mess up one of them for me. Now kick him out of here.
Ted Claiborne has worked as a skinner for five years. He's not very smart, but he can skin a big bull in 30 minutes. And the only hole in the hide will be the one made by the hunter's bullet. Ralph Pierce learned to use a knife in St. Louis. He has a killer's instinct. He doesn't know much about surviving on the prairie. It's his first season with Frank Nesbitt. Frank Nesbitt grew up with a rifle in his hands. He'd kill anything for a price. He loves the killing. For seven years, he's been slaughtering buffalo and boasts that he once dropped 200 from a single stand. Most hunters give up when the herd spooks, but not Nesbitt. He'll follow a herd for days, killing buffalo after buffalo leaving a trail of carcasses that stretch for miles. When the shooting stops, the skinners come up and begin their lowly work. They take only the hides, leaving the meat to rot. The only thing that matters is those smelly hides. After a big kill, they might work all night because a hide left on the prairie would be destroyed by wolves before daylight. In this way, all but a few hundred buffalo out of about 40 million were killed in America between 1871 and 1885. No one could stop the slaughter, and only a few saw the danger of total extinction. One of these men was Jake Jones. He accomplished the impossible by conquering the great Buffalo Samson and became a legend in the American West. They called him Buffalo Jones. The story of Jake Jones begins in the fall of 1881. He wasn't known then as Buffalo Jones, and my grandfather, who told me this story, never could find out much about it. We do know he'd worked down through Texas in the late 70s, where he witnessed the slaughter of the last of the southern herds. Jake sickened of the killing and headed north. For years, he lived alone in the woods of Utah and Wyoming until that fall of 1881. Yes, Jake Jones was a real mystery in a lot of ways. And he was as decent a man as ever walked the plains. A man of few words, but one whose word could be counted on. He made friends with the animals and had respect for all men. One day, Jake chanced on a baby buffalo being attacked by coyotes. He figured the rest of the herd had been killed off by the hunters who were still around, wiping out the last of the buffalo. 
Now, Jake wasn't one to shoot the coyotes. It was his thinking they were just doing what was natural. And besides, the more buffalo that were killed off, the hungrier the coyotes and wolves got. So Jake tried to chase the coyotes off. They were reluctant to pass up an easy meal and kept nipping at the buffalo's legs. When Jake got off his horse, the buffalo gave a powerful kick and the coyotes gave up. The buffalo was exhausted. It was a wild young bull, but weak from loss of blood. Jake managed to throw him down and proceeded to tie him up so he could treat his wounds. He was hurt and confused, too tired to fight. Well, Jake knew if he turned him loose now, the coyotes and wolves would be right back after him again. He wasn't sure what to do with this buffalo, but he'd have to care for him till he was fully healed. Fall passed into the winter of 1882. Jake and his new friend found shelter together. It was a long winter, but the rest helped the buffalo recover from his wounds. By spring, he was two years old and fully healed. wasn't even half grown, but he seemed to know that Jake had saved him. That young bull was still wild, and it wasn't easy making friends, but Jake worked at it. He built a corral, and in the back of his mind, he had an idea. If he could tame this animal, he might be able to break him to ride. Of course, that buffalo would have to grow a little bigger get a lot friendlier. Well, he sure did grow. Jake's buffalo was almost six feet tall at the hump, and he weighed about 2,000 pounds. He had lots of strength and didn't seem to be afraid of anything. So Jake named him Samson out of the Bible. Well, Jake figured it was time. Samson didn't like the looks of that saddle, and Jake didn't like the look in Samson's eye. Yes, sir, it was going to be a long day. The tree anchored the front end, but the hind end kept moving around. For a while, it looked like Jake would be carrying that saddle more than Samson would. They went round and round that tree. Jake easing in, and Samson easing out. There were times when Jake was ready to give up. No one had ever saddled a buffalo before, and Jake was beginning to understand why. Finally, he caught Samson off guard. The saddle was on his back. Easy Jake boy. carefully adjusted the riggings. Easy, boy. Getting the saddle on was one thing. Getting in it was going to be something else. Jake would have to be careful. Samson wouldn't try to hurt him intentionally, but those horns were sharp. Oh. They went around that tree again. Oh. By now, Samson knew what Jake had in mind. Then, 
Jake slipped into the saddle. It was just too easy. Samson broke from the tree, and they were off. It was a struggle. Samson was stubborn as a mule and about 10 times as strong. Besides that, how do you steer a buffalo? When Samson was ready to move, there wasn't much he could do to stop him. And then he'd show his stubbornness and not want to move at all. Jake would break a switch off a nearby tree. He could eventually get Samson to move. The question was, which way? More than likely, he'd plow straight into a bush, or run right through a tree trying to scrape Jake off his back. Finally, they broke out into the open sage, and Jake gave him his head. Samson was still making up his own mind about which way he wanted to go, but gradually, Jake was gaining control. That buffalo cut through the sagebrush like a buzzsaw through oak. Even at a dead run, Samson could keep his feet on rocky ground that would stop a horse. After weeks of work together, Jake's patience and persistence paid off. They were now a team. There is a young man Few people have known He rides a wild buffalo Buffalo Jones Roman Jake's first trip on Samson was to the town of Cedarville about a week's ride. He needed supplies before the winter snow set in, and he thought the trip would be a good test. What Jake didn't know was that on this trip, he'd never reach Cedarville. On their first day out, they ran into a grizzly. Now, Jake knew that bears were fine people if you left them alone. Question was, how would Samson react? chasing off that bear the way Samson did. Jake's buffalo wasn't afraid of anything. In those days, the Indians were having a real hard time. The 
The buffalo had been everything to them. And it didn't take long for the Indians to realize that the herds were almost gone. To an Indian, Jake's buffalo was big magic. This buffalo was a prize worth killing for. The Indian was a poor shot and sort of slow at reloading his rifle. So mad, he almost killed him. He figured a broken jaw was enough punishment. This wouldn't be the last time that someone would try to kill him to get Samson. Boy, howdy. Talk about a tenderfoot. Anybody in a hundred miles knows you fresh out of St. Louis. Look at how you walk. <laughs> you look like a duck. I may be from the city, but that don't mean I don't know a thing or two. You don't know how to walk on this side hill. Point your toes, boy. Point your toes. Well, I wouldn't have to point my toes if Ted hadn't lost them horses. Man can't live out here without a horse. All man needs out here to live is a rifle. And what's the matter with Ted? There's a man riding a buffalo over that side. Speak louder. I swear, you deep. He says there's a... Ted, there is a man riding a buffalo just over that rise. If you're crazy, Ted, ain't nobody rides those critters. Well, if you're so off, I sure, Frank. You just go on and look for yourself. Huh. Ain't that a sight? You ever see anything like that before? Uh -huh. Never did. It is passing strange. However, boy... I think we have found ourselves a pack animal. <laughs> I'll get him right through the gut. Oh, he's gone back behind those trees, Frank. You're gonna have to wait till he gets in the clear. I'll drop both. That hide's worth two dollars. You jackass, we need that animal. neighbor. I never did see a man on a buffalo before. Well, we, we was just funning. Uh, Ted here, Ted, Ted thought you was uh, some kind of mirage. And indeed, I thought so myself till I, I got a closer look at you through my field glasses here. I thought maybe you needed some help. No, no. We were just funning. How come you to be up on that buffalo? Uh-huh. Well, I guess uh, it's time we made a few tracks of our own, boy. Good to see you, stranger. before he ever got off his shot. Oh, Ralph, you do tire me out. He ain't getting away. Frank? No. He ain't getting away. Frank, he's going in those trees. He's going to get away. He ain't getting away. Damnation! Frank, you only winged him. Well, I hadn't counted on that. <laughs> what do you think you're doing? I'm going after him. Come on, jackass. Come on. You don't know nothing. Listen, the lead that buffalo's got, he'll outrun this poor, tired-out creature. Damn. But I'll tell you one thing. 
If I ever see him again, I'll slit him from throat to toe. Nobody gets a drop on Frank Nesbitt. No one knows how long Samson wandered around the prairie. But I think Samson knew he had to find help for Jake. And that's what led him up into the hills and straight into the path of Sam Robinson. Sam couldn't believe his eyes. He'd seen lots of wild buffalo, even shot a few of them himself. But he never expected to find a buffalo with a wounded man on his back. How bad are you? Sam eased forward with his rifle ready. The buffalo seemed tame. could see the wound in Jake's side and realized he was in pretty bad shape. Sam decided to try and lead that buffalo back to his cabin. out for some venison and you come back leading a buffalo. What? Well, he's hurt. Get him off of that beast and into the cabin before he bleeds to death. Oh. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, oh Sam, you be careful. Oh, be all right. I'm going to think you don't like my cooking if you don't eat this. Come on now. Good. That's good for you. Here. That's it. How's my buffalo? Oh, Samson. Oh, he's just fine. You're the one he needs looking after. He's getting all kinds of hay out there in the back corral. In Cedarville, Frank Nesbitt couldn't stop talking about the man who rode a buffalo. He told the story over and over again. Mister, I ain't never heard anything like that before. Well, I'll tell you what we've seen three days south of here. There's a man riding a buffalo out there. That's true. <laughs> we seen it, didn't we, Ted? That's right. I saw Come here, I want to buy you a drink. <laughs> Shut him up, bartender. Three days south here, there's a man riding around on the prairie on a buffalo, believe it or not. Soon the word was spread around that there was a man who rode the plains on a buffalo. And it wasn't long before Jake became known as Buffalo Jones. As his legend grew, some people swore they'd seen him down Texas way years ago. And others that he'd saved the buffalo up near Montana in 79. Shouldn't oh, be up I'm there. Fine. Well, now, don't get tired out. I'm getting fairly strong now. Well, I know you're better, but be careful. Jake's wound healed very slowly. Gotta get out and see your friend. But right? Samson never left and seemed to know that Jake was in good hands. He's been cutting a lot of grass for him. The Robinsons were fine people. They lived off Sam's hunting and trapping and what little gold they could pan from the river. Maybe someday they'd make a rich strike. But for now, they were happy. It didn't take Jake long to make friends with a raccoon named Bandit. Bandit had been visiting the Robinsons on and off for years, 
Always bringing a little mischief along with it. Take it those critters, don't you? Winter came on early that year, and the Robinsons said it was the coldest winter they could remember. Temperatures dropped to 50 below. And the entire countryside was locked in a freezing grip of ice and snow. No one would forget this winter. It was so cold that even the river had frozen completely. I swear you worry more about that buffalo and that raccoon than you would about your own kid. Well, it's pretty cold out there, Miss Robinson. You like Miss Tutu? He does. I think I'll invite him every night. <laughs> Here, you better have some apple pie. Now, Jake, I don't know about the buffalo. I hope it doesn't get too cold. Bandit was doing fine with Jake and the Robinsons looking after him. But lots of other animals didn't survive that winter. And those that did grew coats of fur thicker than ever before. Food was scarce everywhere. It was late that winter when Bandit had the adventure of his life. Sam and Jake had gone hunting when Bandit wandered down to the river for an afternoon stroll. Sometimes a cougar can be bluffed by a ferocious sounding raccoon. And Bandit was putting on his best bluff. to bluff that cougar time after time. But finally, the bluff was over. This time, that cougar meant business. And its bluff had finally worn out. had bandit by the scruff of his neck. He would try to drown him in the river. The water wasn't deep enough. The cougar backed up, looking for a deeper spot. Suddenly, he's in too deep. enough, and so had Bandit. But Bandit's day wasn't over. The ice had thawed upstream, creating a flash flood. and huge pieces of ice came crashing downstream. And 
There went bandits sailing by on a chunk of ice. He scampered from one piece of ice to another and finally made it to shore. Jake found Bandit downstream and brought him back so his wounds could heal. But for quite a while, he gave that river a wide berth. Finally, sun warmed the countryside, and the feeling of new life was everywhere. Turned out Bandit wasn't a male after all, and she surprised everyone when she gave birth to twins. Now maybe she had something to worry about that would keep her out of mischief. Whenever Mom turned her back, they'd be in trouble. quite a predicament. Mom can't decide which one to help first. He's hanging on, but his brother is taking his first swim. Mom isn't too happy, but she's going to be a lot less happy in a minute. Now, where'd he go? Come here, you little rascal. Where you been? That spring, the hunters were plagued by bad luck. My grandfather, though, told me they'd brought it on themselves. Days went by without seeing a single buffalo, and they fought constantly among themselves over the direction they should take to find the herds. I think we ought to be heading further to the west. Well, go on and head west, then. You don't have to stay with me. I ain't your daddy. Ah, Frank, I swear, we've been walking for days, and there ain't no buffalo around here. I do get tired of listening to you bellyache. Well, my feet hurt. Why don't you go to Denver, check into a hotel for a week or two? Oh, you ain't done nothing but complain since this morning. Hey, Frank, ain't this where we were in 79? Yeah. There's plenty of buffalo then. The buffalo were just about gone. Nesbitt could still track down a herd once in a while. They weren't the big herds like he used to find. And since most of them had been shot at before, they were spooky. And the hunters had a hard time getting close enough to shoot. The price had gone up to $2 a high. In desperation, and to satisfy his greed, Nesbitt decided to let Ted shoot.
head. You ain't no help. You gut shot that cow, she's gonna go a mile and a half or five miles before she falls, and I ain't chasing her. Frank, she's nearly half right. a mile away. I will do the shooting from here on. You can skin, and you can learn. Damn. Sam left early one morning to do some hunting. It was a beautiful day, and he wandered further afield than he'd ever gone before. Jake was following Sam's tracks, but he wasn't the only one. Jake didn't know it, but Sam was fighting for his life. A second grizzly was looking on to share Sam for lunch. By now, Sam was hurt and playing dead. didn't even slow those bears down. They kept right on fighting. It was over an hour before the bears realized lunch had left. Sam's wounds weren't serious, and that evening, Jake decided to tell the Robinsons that he was leaving. Maybe I'll run into those hunters and mess up their fun. You stay away from those mean fellers. You know what happened the last time. Well, I guess it's personal against those three. I don't figure all the buffalo should be wiped out. There's millions of them. No, there ain't. Not anymore. Well, you know you're welcome to stay, Jake. Plenty of good friends here. And my family's due from St. Joe any day. <laughs> I haven't seen my brother since, well, since Sam and I left. He's got the reddest hair I ever did see. Used to be my jealous of it. Hmm. Always wanted red hair. Myself.
By now, the hunters were desperate. They had more hides than they could carry, and Frank Nesbitt wasn't about to leave without taking every one of them with him, no matter what he had to do. Boys, it's been a long, hard winter, but I believe those nice people down in that wagon are gonna solve all our problems. <laughs> Get them right from here. You jackass, that's 750 yards down there. Oh, Frank. Now, if you miss, we lose those mules and everything. After the camp, spread out and wait for my signal. We best hunker down. I don't want them to turn around and spot us outlined against this sky either. The next morning, the Robinsons' relatives were camped by a small stream. That's the square, Frank. Get going there. What'd you do with the woman, Ralph? Frank? Hmm? You done killed a woman. What? There ain't no need to do that, Ralph. You give me that bag. Give me that. We don't have no pack saddles, so tie everything you, on, you can on behind these animals and we'll get out of here. Ted, I want you to make it look like Indians done it. Okay. Can you do that? Look at my new shirt. That there meal's gonna get the print. Well, they ravaged the wagon, taking whatever they wanted. Ted helped himself to a pistol and a watch. And he was the one who left the evidence that would eventually incriminate all of them. Well, all right. Let's get out of here.
Jake had been on the trail for four days when he spotted the wagon. God. By the body, he found a scarf he had seen before. It was a baby boy, about eight weeks old. Jake bundled the baby in blankets and leather, sort of papoose style. He'll be okay. Yeah. Quiet down now. Quiet down. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. did what he could. Jake realized that this was the family the Robinsons had been expecting. He made the little fellow as comfortable as he could. Jake knew Samson wasn't the smoothest ride. It was a good four-day trip back to the Robinson's cabin. And the baby might not survive that long without food. So Jake decided to trust in Samson's endurance and sureness of foot. He would take the shorter route over the mountains. It was dangerous, and it was rugged. But he had to risk it to save the baby's life. This night, there would not be much sleep for Jake and the baby. Or for Nesbitt and his partners. It was just as easy as skinning a rabbit. Oh, you didn't have to kill her. Killing women ain't no good. Ah, shut up. My knife is just as good on people as it is on them buffalo. And it don't matter none, man or woman. Well, I sure wish it was better on them buffalo. You wreck more hides than you skin. Ain't that right, Frank? What's that? I said, ain't that right. Well, ain't what right? That old man can't hear nothing no more. It's that gun going off in his ears all day long. That old man is the finest hunter there is. That's right, isn't it, Frank? How's that? Leastways. 
He ain't no coward. Only cowards kill women. Meet a coward. He's a coward. It don't take nothing to shoot a bunch of dumb buffalo from behind a clump of grass. <laughs> I tell you, those buffalo are so dumb, if you drop the lead cow, the rest of them just stand there in a bunch until you get them all. Cows, calves, bulls, every last one of them. What you got there? Give me that. That's mine. Don't you give that back to me. <laughs> Look at that. I found it. Frank, make him give that back to Took me. Took a watch off that guy. Give it back to him. He found it. Woo-hoo. Give it to what him. What else did you find, huh? Give it ah. to him. <laughs> Hold her, boys. That's enough. <laughs> Just stop it right there. Come up from there, you nitwit. You can get out now. Get. He broke my nose. <laughs> Why, so he did. <laughs> it broke all right, now get. I want my share. You owe me. I'll tell you what you get. You get your life for a 4570 through your belly and out your backbone. <laughs> now get. You can have a mule. Ralph left. He was through with Nesbitt. But he hoped to run into Ted someday, and he'd make sure the odds were more even. Next morning, Jake reached the snow line. Cold rain started to fall. It was the first time Samson had been in the high country, and he was taking it easy, picking his way. Made it over the worst of the mountains, Jake stopped on the lower slope. The baby cried continuously. He had to feed him soon or he would die. The little fellow had been at least two days without food.
perhaps he could find some sort of game and make a broth. Jake checked his pistol and reloaded with dry powder. Samson knew that while Jake was gone, the baby was his responsibility. Not many wild animals would come close to a buffalo. tackled more than he could handle, and he headed for higher ground. But he did leave his mark on Jake. The fire had died down. Jake hadn't returned, and Samson was nervous. right to be. One of his old enemies decided to take advantage of the situation. When that wolf couldn't distract Samson by going around to the front, he tried a sneak attack from behind, but Samson was too quick for him. It was late in the afternoon, and Jake was beginning to worry. He had to find something to feed the baby. Pine wasn't much for dinner, but it was the best he could do. It might make a pretty good dinner at that. Jake boiled some meat to make a broth. When it cooled, he tried to get the baby to drink. He couldn't tell how much the little fella drank, but it seemed to quiet him down. He fell asleep in Jake's arms.
long night without sleep, and the next morning the baby was tired. Jake tried to get some more food inside him, but he was now too weak to eat. By midday, they reached the river, the last obstacle to cross before reaching the Robinson's cabin. fellow was still all right, Jake decided they would all go together in an attempt to get across. He would carry the baby in his arms. With the melting snow, the gentle stream had become a raging torrent. Jake looked for the best place to cross. It wouldn't be easy. He wondered if Samson's strength could match the current. Jake kept the baby's head above water as best he could. It was all that he and Samson could do to get back to the same side they'd started from. Jake knew he had to find a way across that river, and fast. There was only one other way he would try swimming the baby across. Samson would come across later. ordeal for Jake, but the boy was safely across. That wasn't bad coming across here, was it? Yeah, you're okay. You make it okay. Now it was back for Samson. Samson had tried that river before, and he wasn't anxious to go again. Begrudgingly, he started to cross. With Jake's help, Samson made it. Even brought part of his lunch with him. <laughs> 
Fortunately, from here, it was just a short ride to the camp. Jake's back. Nettie. The difficult journey was over. But now, Jake's hardest task was finding the words to tell the Robinsons about their relatives. Mrs. Robinson, I'm sorry. Oh. Oh, no. I found your kin. They're dead. I brung the baby back. You need some food awful bad. It was Samson who did it. I couldn't have made it without him. They named him Jess. After our father. <coughs> Sam, get some water. Jake, there's sugar in the cabin. Get it and mix it with warm water. <coughs> How can you be sure that these are the men that you're looking for? No, Sam, I know it was them buffalo hunters. Same ones I had to run in with last fall. This belonged to one of them, and I found that right by the wagon. They won't get away with this. How are you going to find them? I'll be leaving in the morning. I'll track them, and I'll find them. Before sunrise, Jake was on his way back to the wagon, where he hoped to pick up the trail of the killers. He had been on the track for hours, his mind filled with thoughts of the three men who had tried to kill him and later murdered the baby's parents. He had found their camp and knew that the hunters had split up. It was some time before he noticed Samson was acting strangely. He sensed something. Jake wasn't sure, but he thought it meant wolves. They'd be ready. He removed the saddlebags to give old Samson his best fighting chance. And this time, he wouldn't be tied to a tree. were trying to drag away the saddlebags. The scavengers were hungry and would take anything they could get. This time, Samson would teach that wolf a lesson. Get him, Samson. was over. The wolves had had enough. They wouldn't drive Samson again. Good boy, Samson. Good boy. Good boy, Samson.
Jake was sure he was on the right trail, but the rocky ground made tracking difficult. All the signs pointed north, so he turned Sampson and headed for Cedarville. What he didn't know was that at that very minute, Frank Nesbitt and Ted had just arrived in town. It was near the water hole that Jake found fresh signs, and he knew two of the killers were just ahead. He spurred Samson on. are on Ted with his watch. Is that all right, bartender? Oh, Frank, I found that watch. Well, never mind about your watch, Ted. We'll get you another. You said I could keep that watch. Did you think you could keep it till you died? Come on now, have a drink with me. You know, there is people say there ain't no more buffaloes left, but Ted and me got 22 just about a half a day from here. Took me a half an hour, 45 minutes. Shoot them, ain't that right, Ted? That's right, Frank. I sure would like my watch back. Your watch is gone now, so quit to belly aching. Where's the fellas that rode in on them horses? Oh, the two hunters? Oh, they're down in the saloon. People of Cedarville would never forget Buffalo Jones. Nor would they forget Samson, the buffalo that tore up the Crystal Palace Saloon. Jake told the sheriff about what had happened to the baby's parents. The sheriff offered to send out a posse. But Jake felt it was his job. The way my grandfather remembered it, Jake insisted on tracking down the last of the killers. He headed back toward the mountains, hoping to pick up his trail.
the tracks indicated one man on a mule. This might be the man Jake was looking for. He decided to circle around the mountain. With a little luck, their paths might cross. Ralph hadn't had much luck since splitting up with Nesbitt. He was heading back to the bright lights of St. Louis. The man would have to come down that draw if Jake had figured right. He'd wait here. Jake could hear the mule coming, and he felt Samson tense up. Samson was on the move before Jake could spur him on. Buffalo herds were almost gone. But one buffalo, Samson, had done his best to even the score with the hunters. Buffalo Jones stopped once more with the Robinsons before heading west. He said his goodbyes and wished the baby well. Well, I guess you know by now who my grandfather was. Yep, that's him, right there. Born in 1882 and rescued by the man who, from that year on, became known as Buffalo Jones.